into two protein data bank related advertisements that have been alternating on the screen. Uh, please join us May 4 5 for our special symposium celebrating the 50th anniversary of the protein data bank. The uh, registration information is uh, on the slide. Uh, the fee is nominal and the, uh, the lineup for the two half day uh, meeting is uh, uh, nothing short of uh, spectacular. On the other slide uh, that uh, uh, we've been uh, been showing, uh, there are career opportunities uh, with the RCSP Protein Data Bank uh, on both on the East and West Coast uh, uh, here at Rutgers and uh, our performance site at UCSD at the Supercomputer Center there. So please uh, uh, apply if you are interested. And if you know somebody who you think would be a good fit for uh, either of the roles, uh, please, um, uh, please refer the uh, the opportunity to them. So I'll uh, I'll now uh, turn to introducing uh, our speaker for today, Dr. Clara Kyokop, who is an associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics, and a member of the um, Center for RNA Biology and the Wilmot Cancer Institute at the University of Rochester School of Medicine and, and Dentistry. Uh, Clara uh, was an undergraduate at the University of uh, Wisconsin, where she graduated first in her class, and then uh, went to uh, uh, to Caltech uh, and did uh, her uh, PhD, and then came to Rockefeller University, where she worked uh, with me um, and uh, led our foray into uh, RN the RNA splicing machinery. Uh, two years into her postdoc, I decided to go to industry, and uh, Clara uh, was kind enough to uh, to take the project that uh, that we had started together, and um, continue working that very productive vein, mining that productive vein, and um, uh, she's going to talk to us uh, today about uh, U2AF at the pre-mRNA splice site a disease vulnerable step uh, of gene expression. So thank you uh, for joining virtually, Clara. It's great, uh, great to see you doing so well. And I uh, am looking forward to your, uh, your talk. Uh, I'll go off video now. And uh, as soon as as soon as you, uh, your slides look good, which they do, uh, please start. All right. Thank you, Stephen. So it's um, nice to see everyone if virtually um, it's Originally, of course, this was planned to be in person, but a silver lining is this is much easier actually for travel and everything like that. So, so today there are two parts to uh, two related projects that I'd like to tell you about. Um, both are related to the U2AF recognition of the three prime splice site, which is the project that was started in Stephen's lab when I was a postdoc and is very grateful to be able to take this with me. It's a really exciting project. Um, so the first part is how does U2AF recognize the three prime splice site signal? U2AF acts like Tata binding protein, which is I think Stevens, one of Stevens' favorite proteins, um, at, to recognize the three prime splice site and then to recruit and initiate the splicing process. So it's a really key factor among the hundreds of factors in the spliceosome um, to really start this whole process. So first, we're trying to understand how it can identify the splice site. And secondly is, um, can a small molecule modulate U2AF and selectively kill cancer cells? And this has really gained relevance since pre-messenger RNA splicing has emerged as a real, really dysfunctional pathway in cancers and particularly myelodysplastic syndromes, which is a sort of a, a pre-leukemia. And as a spoiler alert, the second part has more general uh, interest possibly because um, it's proof of concept that by enhancing an early stage of a multi-step process, you can actually inhibit that process. So it's a new way of thinking about how to develop small molecule inhibitors as potential therapeutics. So as, as you know, almost all of your genes, almost all human genes contain these intervening non-coding introns that are spliced from the pre-messenger RNA and then translated into proteins. And when I first started in Stephen's lab, it was thought that only maybe you know a couple thousand genes had these. But since then, it's really emerged with new technologies, including initially microarrays and now RNA-seq and all the ClipSeq and all the seeks that you may have 
um, that almost all of your genes are actually alternatively spliced. In fact, 85% um, of human genes encode alternative transcripts at about um, the, at, at least 15% isoform frequency. And this is an enormous source of transcript diversity, at least in principle, a gene encoding N cassette exons, that is, this is the most frequent source of alternative splicing, when a particular protein coding region is either um, included or excluded from the final spliced product. This is the most common form of alternative splicing, cassette splicing. And so in principle, a typical eight exon gene could generate at least 256 different messenger RNAs. So I don't want to mislead you though. This doesn't usually happen. There are a few cases of really extreme splicing, like the D-scan gene in Drosophila for neurogenesis, and then plants, oh, they love splicing because their, their time frame is a whole different one from ours. But in, on average in humans, there are about three to four major splice forms per gene. Still, that's a lot of diversity. So it's a real challenge to distinguish pre-messenger RNA splice sites, both for computational, computational prediction, for us to try to say, okay, this is where a gene is gonna be spliced and we know this, um, but also for the spliceosome in cells. It's actually quite amazing that the genes are spliced with high, that your transcripts are spliced with high fidelity. But this has to be, because if, you, if it's missed by one nucleotide, then the entire message encoding a protein will be garbled. So, so it's really important to have high fidelity. Um, so it's quite amazing because the splice sites themselves in the, the primary message from your gene transcript are marked by relatively short and often degenerate consensus sequences, um, including this polyprimidine tract here, which is a major focus of our interest. Um, it's actually quite degenerate in some cases. It has use, but you know, they're not absolutely required in humans. So the, these short degenerate sequences mark the splice sites and transcripts that are thousands of nucleotides young, long. Yet, splicing is, does have relatively high fidelity, at least it's a similar to transcription. So if you can consider trans transcription to be high fidelity, then um, splicing is as well. So this is a really exciting problem of structural biology is how does the spliceosome find the correct splice sites, and it's one that's not entirely understood at this point. So the pre-messenger RNA splicing process is a multi-step process that requires ATP for conformational changes in this, in a large spliceosome of five small nuclear RNAs and more than 170 different proteins. Now, it's no surprise because these have to recognize these tiny, these tiny splice sites in the transcripts, right? Um, and it has to be high fidelity. But in the early stage of splicing, this relatively small and simple protein first recognizes the three prime splice site. It's the U2AF heterodimer with two subunits. Um, the first is the large subunit, our U2AF2, which recognizes the polypermanent tract signal and it acts as a heterodimer with the U2AF1 subunit. Now, U2AF2 is Traditionally, it's been considered the, the major subunit, and it's required um, for embryonic development, and it, it's found in ClipSeq to contact a lot of sites. <laughs> so it contacts the major class of splice sites, and um, it's found at most um, polypermidine tracts, nearly all, um, probably all with an error. Um, now, U2AF1 has really come into the spotlight recently. U2AF1 was like, oh, that's an auxiliary subunit. It's required for splicing of a subset of AG-dependent splice sites, uh, which have shorter and more degenerate um, polyprotein tracts, which, which makes sense because it's, contacts, it's known to contact the AG dinucleotide, which is a consensus right here at the intron-exon junction. And so it's... Um, and so it, it makes sense that it would be assisting the large subunit to, to recognize the more degenerate sites. But recently it's really come into the, into the spotlight because of its disease relevance. Now it's been long known that um, inherited mutations often occur in specific splice sites of specific transcripts. Now you can't, usually you don't get the inherited mutation in your splicing factor itself because that's embryonic lethal. That's just too much for your, for, to take. 
However, these specific transcripts are recurrently mutated in inherited diseases um, that um, are associated with uh, defects in recognition by U2AF, and some of these are listed here, um, including neurofibromatosis, um, retinitis pigmentosa type, uh, uh, type 2, um, and um, some of the muscular dystrophies and cancers. Well, now, um, these have long been known, and also this sort of a sort of just general dysregulation of splicing and cancers also had long been noted. But in about 2011, splicing really came into the highlight for its disease relevance when it was found that about 60% of mild dysplasia associated mutations, that is, um, acquired mutations that are associated with mild dysplastic syndromes, are acquired in genes encoding splicing factors. And this is shown in more detail on this um, slide here where we can see that approximately 60% of the acquired mutations associated with these myelodysplastic syndromes, or MDS, occur in um, the splicing uh, pathway, in, in proteins that act in the splicing pathway. Now, this was quite surprising at the time because a splicing mutation was expected to lead to a plethora of nonspecific cellular abnormalities rather than to promote, promote this, this clonal proliferation that is associated with the, with the myelodysplastic syndromes and, and, and later on leukemia. So I'll, I'll explain MDS a little bit more right before the second part of the talk about small molecules, but, but basically this is, a, this is a bone marrow disorder that really affects the proliferation and, 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 and of the, the blood cells and generation of the blood cells. So this is a big surprise because why would you have a mutation in a pathway that you need for cells to divide and proliferate and have that be associated with a cancer? The cancer needs to get mutations that will help it to take over your body. So that was very unexpected. And even today, it's, it's uncertain why these splicing factor mutations are associated with, with MDS and leukemias and cer certain types of cancers. There have been a few ideas, including, um, of course, the obvious one was, was splicing, but it seems that only a handful of transcripts are affected, and if, they, if you compare the different transcripts among affected transcripts among the different affected splicing factor mutants, there are only a few that overlap, and they just don't seem to be all that causative most of the time. Um, there are also some thoughts about polyadenylation and other associated pathways, that, because all the pathways are inter, intercoupled. Splicing is tightly coupled with transcription and polyadenylation. But um, I think one, one hypothesis that, that makes some sense and, and has quite a bit of evidence at this point is that the, um, that this, the errors in splicing generate um, R loops as things uh, slow down, which are these RNA-DNA hybrids that occur during transcription. But this, they are known to increase genomic instability. So that would then lead to downstream effects and make some sense since splicing factor mutations are founder mutations. They occur early um, and um, um, are thought to lead to the more, the, the real uh, mutations that really cause the, the downstream leukemia. All right. so. That, so that is exciting stuff. Um, I'm a structural biologist. So, so what we wanted to understand more about was how are these um, splicing factors acting and uh, what are the mutations doing at the molecular level? So there are um, four frequently mutated splicing factor myelodysplastic syndromes um, shown here. And one of the major ones is U2AF1. This is the small subunit of U2AF that was thought to be more an auxiliary subunit to U2AF2. Now, U2F1 is mutated in about 10% of myelodysplastic syndromes. It's also associated with lung adenocarcinoma. And um, the mutations in U2F1 recur at two sites, but primarily at this S serine 34 position, which is, is located in one of two zinc knuckle, pro, uh, zinc, zinc knuckle domains in the protein. And the other is a Q157. This is a much lower frequency of mutation rate. But as, as you can notice here um, throughout, for the, most of these splicing factors, the mutations are not random and null, with the exception of ZRSR2. Instead, they occur at specific hotspots that really try, they really show up at, at key interfaces for the function. So not only are these interesting disease-related mutations, they give us a clue into the function of the proteins themselves. They, are gonna, they occur and reoccur at key functional interfaces. All right, so U2AF1 
the key functional interfaces appear to be at serine 34 and zinc knuckle 1, and also uh, glutamine 157. So among the other splicing factors that are affected, um, one is ZRSR2. Now ZRSR2 is actually a U2F1 paralog, and it occurs, it's found associated with the minor spliceosome. So this could be why, among all of these, it's the only one to have truncating substitutions throughout. Instead of having hot spot missense mutations, it tends to just be null. And then that can be associated with certain types of MDS. Um, other splicing factors affected include SRSF2, which is a, um, an early stage splicing factor as well. It's involved in alternative splicing. And importantly, SF3B1, which is associated with refractory anemias with ring sideroblasts. And this is a very major frequently mutated splicing factor, not only in MDS, but also in uveal melanoma and other many other cancers as well. All right. so, so so U2F1 is here associated with MDS mutations, and U2F2, not so much. Uh, U2F2, however, is mutated in about 1% of MDS. And again, I would hypothesize this lower frequency of mutation may be because it's just, it's everywhere. So if you get too many mutations of this, it's just not going to help a cancer, uh, can, you know, the cost-benefit ratio just doesn't work out to promote leukemias. All right. so. So here's our very interesting Utoya heterodimer here is disease associated. Now let's look first at its normal functions so that we have a basis for comparison for what goes wrong in these, um, these pre-leukemias. All right, so as I mentioned, Utoya acts early in the splicing process. It has an analogous role, I like to think, as Tata binding protein, and that's probably why Stephen was interested in it originally. I remember when I first came to his lab, he was like, do you want to work on TBP mutants, or do you want to work on this new unknown thing that could be really hard? And of course, as a young person, you're like, yeah, the, the really hard thing, I want to work on that, that'll be really cool, and then it's really hard. But So we're still working on it, but we're making progress. So here, um, what U2AF does first is it binds at the three prime splice site, as a heterodimer with a third protein, splicing factor one. Splicing factor one is kicked out and it's replaced by the U2 small nuclear ribonuclear protein, including the SF3B1 subunit, which interestingly associates with U2F. And um, then in a series of ATP dependent conformational changes, the two steps of transesterification take place and the exons are joined and the intron is excised. All right, so that's what U2F is there for. Um, how does it do it? We don't know still. We have an idea, but we're still, the big picture is not yet known. So since 2015, um, I'm sure you've, you've all seen these amazing spliceosome structures coming out from Yigong Shi's lab and um, Reinhardt Luhrmann and Kiyoshi Nagai, um, sadly, uh, I wish he was still uh, doing more. Um, but so these really amazing spliceosome structures have been coming out, nature science, you know, front page news. Uh, at to date now there are cryoEM structures of nearly all the stages of the splicing process. Again, this is an ATP dependent multi-step process in which there's a series of really exciting conformational changes and entry and exit of, of subunits. So we know almost all of them except the one that is the most disease relevant, in my opinion, <laughs> so, which is the early stage where U2AF recognizes the three prime splice site. So despite these breakthrough structures of spliceosomes, we still don't have a view of U2AF acting in the spliceosome. And so this is what keeps me up at night. And um, some, some glimpses, um, some clues have come um, the closest we've gotten so far is from Ray Zhao's lab at Colorado Denver. She did an, a yeast uh, E-complex, or really it's the U1 small nuclear ribonuclear protein at the five prime splice site. And um, in this um, structure, this cryo-electron microscopy structure, at the five prime splice site, she, she does see some unassigned electron density which she assigned as the yeast U2F2 homolog. Now, this was tantalizing, but it's it's still, it doesn't include the three prime splice site, but it makes sense because U2F and SF1 are supposed to communicate with the five prime splice site. 
so they couple the splice sites. So it makes sense that it would be reaching over and interacting with the 5' prime splice site. Um, another sort of challenge with this is that the, the yeast E2F is, is it's pretty divergent. So it doesn't have the same central role as it does in humans. And there's no U2F1 homologue. So, so we don't know. All right, so that brings us to, to the first major question here, which is how does U2F identify the three prime splice site? And then we'll talk about um, small molecule modulators and how, how this might be going awry in, in, in uh, mild dysplastic syndromes. Hey, Rebecca, how are you doing? So, so although we don't have the entire structure of the intact 3' prime splice site complex communicating with the 5' prime splice site, what we do have is piecewise structures of U2F regions, many of which were started in Stephen Burley's lab. So here we have the, the domain structures of the two subunits, and they have RNA recognition motifs in U2F2, and then this interesting domain called a U2F homology motif, which looks like an RNA recognition motif and was thought to be one for like decades. Um, all right, so what do we know? What we do know is that U2F recognizes the polypromidine tract with its two tandem RNA recognition motifs. And first, let's take a look at the structure without any RNA present. It's It was, uh, so we have these two bead-like RNA recognition motifs, and by small angle x-ray scattering or by single molecule fret, it appears that they adopt a wide range of conformations. And they show a broad conformational ensemble, and this is both from my lab and the laboratory of Michael Sattler. So, so we, in general, we, we tend to agree. So this is actually good because he uses primarily nuclear magnetic resonance and I use primarily X-ray crystallography. And so, and so it, it's nice actually to see this complement coming through. So what Michael Sattler found is that in the absence of RNA, there is a major, what he calls a closed conformation among this ensemble. And he was able to characterize this by beautiful paramagnetic resonance enhancement and NMR work. Um, and in this closed conformation, the RNA binding surface of the RNA recognition motif 2, which is the major RNA binding domain of the two uh, domains in the protein, is masked by RM1. And so, and so this is not in a conformation that's really competent to bind to RNA in a high affinity kind of way. But this is important because this comes back, this comes back later. So this is an interesting um, closed conformation. And honestly, based on our single molecule fret and small angle x-ray scattering, I really had a lot of time with this when it first came out in 2011. But um, later work, I, I, have, I have full confidence in it, and it's quite beautiful work. All right, so, so what happens when RNA is bound? In the presence of RNA, both x-ray crystallography and, again, um, NMR studies show that the, the, the two RNA recognition motifs of, of U2F, they open up into a side-by-side -side configuration. And as a plug for the X-ray crystallography, we, we could see in our X-ray crystallography the detailed interactions with the nucleotides and also the position of the inter-RM um, linker and the N and C terminal extensions, which form beautiful alpha helices that actually interact with the RNA. So I think one uh, challenge historically for this project, and maybe a lesson for many of you structural biologists, is that the original constructs that both myself and Michael Sattler were using were too short. We we lacked the NNC terminal alpha helices, which actually add several orders of magnitude to the RNA binding affinity, and they interact with the RNA and they stabilize the inter-RM linker here. So this is very important to include. So if you're having trouble with your proteins, maybe come just a little bit longer. Keep going, keep going out. <laughs> so. Uh, but for cryo-EM people, you know, just take the whole thing, right? So that's the, that's the beauty of cryo-EM. But anyway, so you can see that these two RMs, they open up and they bind to nine nucleotides of the polyprimidine tract here. u 2 prefers a, a polyuridine site. That's the optimal consensus splice site, which all makes sense. So it likes these uridines. But in some sites, we found that it can tolerate nucleotide substitutions. So... Um, for two examples are shown here. It seems that some sites are more promiscuous than others. And um, 
one promiscuous site that we found initially is near the um, uh, near the three prime region of the bound RNA site, and in this site we found that we could uh, trap or co-crystallize uh, guanosine instead of a uridine, and this is kind of a neat structure because the uridine switches from an anti-conformation, which is more common and traditional, to a syn conformation in the G form so that it can actually fit into the same binding pocket. So it's an RNA uh, conformational change, an RNA, a local RNA change that, change that actually enables UTOIF to recognize um, a guanosine at this site, so we can tolerate a guanosine here. Um, at the central nucleotide site, most of the contacts are with the inter-RM linker, and they're not really side chain contacts, and it turns out this is relatively promiscuous as well. Um, at this site, uh, for example, if we put in adenosine in unpublished work, this adenosine, interestingly, will cause the entire RNA backbone to flex out and, and pop out. So the, the RMs, they stay nearly the same, but it's the RNA itself that is flexible and changing. And perhaps this is also due to the, I would imagine this is also due to the context here because polyuridine is the, one of the most flexible sequences you can get. And it could be that this flexibility of the RNA itself is an inherent important property for positioning the five prime and splice site and branch site for the actual, you know, for to, in preparation for association of the spliceosome. Now that's part of the, the magic, the magic requirement to have this polypermidine tract at the three prime splice site not just um, recognition of the nucleotides themselves, which we do see. All right, so that was, the U2F recognizes the, the uridine tract, and it does so, it can adapt to this degenerate human splice sites by, in part, the inherent flexibility of the RNA. All right, so, now, so let's look on at U2F1. So U2F1, this is the project that I started in Stevens' laboratory, and at the time, Okay, this is so I'm, I'm going to date myself, but this was decades ago. But at the time, it was thought that U2F1 contained an RNA recognition motif, and that this RNA recognition motif was responsible for recognizing the AG site. But what we found is that rather than an RNA recognition motif, it has a different protein interaction motif, and it, this motif has the same fold as an RNA recognition motif. And in fact, in my opinion, it's still misclassified as an RM in most cases. So if you actually look it up in, in an ontology server, then it comes up as an RNA recognition motif still, but it ain't. It just, it doesn't have the ribonucleoprotein motifs to interact with RNA, and instead it binds to a region from the U2F2 subunit. So we, we, turn, we termed this as a U2F homology motif, or UHM which shares the fold of the RNA recognition motif, but has diverged in its functional utility. So how does, how does U2AF recognize the RNA? It doesn't have an RNA recognition motif. So this uh, challenge was solved most recently when um, the Yoshida and Obayashi groups solved a yeast homologue of nearly full length U2F1. It's, it's not as long as the, the, the human factor that, that I work on, um, but it contains the zinc nuclear motifs and the, and the UHM. This is the fission yeast. So Baker's yeast does not have a U2F1 homologue, but fission yeast does. And um, it's actually pretty well conserved. I, I can't remember, I think it's 45%. So it's well above what you need to have a, a reliable homology model. Um, it just lacks maybe some of the ex auxiliary domains, the U2F1 in humans has a long arginine, serine rich, really yucky domain. <laughs> so that's, but it's, it's highly phosphorylated and can assist with the kneeling of the U2S in RNA. Perhaps it helps the human factor since the, the splice sites in humans are more degenerate than they are in yeast. But to come back, the take home I'm trying to say here is that we have a beautiful structure of a fission yeast homologue of U2F. U2F1 found to a region, a ligand from U2F2. And from this structure, we can see that the zinc knuckle motifs actually come in and mask the supposed RNA binding surface of the, this RM fold, which lacks the consensus motifs. Instead, 
the RM fold binds to the zinc knuckle motifs and the zinc knuckles actually do the RNA binding and they display the cancer associated hot spots at the interface with the RNA. So um, the, I've shown the, the MDS mutations at the RNA interface here. Um, the serine um, 34's residue is most frequently mutated to either a phenylalanine or to a much lesser extent sometimes a tyrosine and that is located right here at the minus 3 position relative to the splice site junction and the glutamine 157 is located at the plus 1 position relative to the splice site junction and they interact directly with the nucle nucleotides at the plus 1 and minus 3 positions of this co-crystallized AG containing uh, splice junction. This is very satisfying because the field had been wondering um, why in RNA-seq experiments the S34, serine 34F mutation would increase use of splice sites that generally had a cytosine at the minus 3 position compared to a uridine or T here and a Q157 proline, these are the most common mutations a Q157 mutation would increase use of a plus one guanosine. So these, this structure actually quite beautifully explains the sequence logos of affected sites. And we also had done some RNA binding experiments with the mutant proteins and the human factors and had so shown similar trends in most cases that agreed with the splice sites. And so um, this is a nice complement that shows that the, the affected residues um, actually do change alter interactions with the expected uh, nucleotides at the splice junction. So, yeah, <laughs> so, so it's very satisfying that, that hotspot mutations clue us in to the functional interfaces of proteins. Okay, so we have all these pieces of the puzzle. We have the U2F RNA recognition motifs found to RNA. We have them without RNA in a different conformation. We have the heterodimer and we have um, a, a yeast um, homolog uh, with and without RNA. So we have pieces, but we don't know how the pieces fit together. And so that's the real challenge going forward. So let me tell you a little bit about the steps we've taken to try and address this challenge. Um, it's only moderate success, but it's still a clue. So um, it's given that we have all these spliceosome structures, it seemed that the most logical approach would be to use cryo-electron cryo microscopy. Now one challenge for looking at the three prime splice site, perhaps not for the whole thing, but I think the whole thing is really flexible and hard to make. Um, but to, we thought first to look at the three prime splice site that we traditionally make for RNA binding experiments. We make this ternary complex all the time. So we're like, We'll use cryo-EM. Everybody else is doing it. This will be great. It'll be so easy. We'll pop in a grid. We'll pop it out. We'll get our structure. Hey, cryo-EM is much harder than you guys let on. It's really hard. So, especially for our little complex, it's only 100 kilodaltons. So, I kind of knew this starting out. So, initially, I thought, oh, this is too small, especially since we started trying to do cryo-EM quite a few years ago, and that was before, I think, um, the K3 detectors have come out. So at, at the time, I think 100 kilodaltons, when I first started trying to think about cryo-EM for this, 100 kilodaltons is really borderline. I think now, maybe not so much. So I'm hoping we can approve this soon. Um, so, but to get the molecular weight up, I thought we should just leave on an MBP tag that we had been using anyway to purify the protein. And I also added a his sumo tag to facilitate purification because this MBP, it's actually uh, quite hard to do a subtractive step on it once you've got mannose bound to it, et cetera. So it has its own little issues. Um, so we added the MVP. We include an alanine, a five alanine linker, which according to crystallographers should be a relatively rigid linker um, that's been used historically to promote crystallization. So I was hoping to keep a relatively inflexible conformation or, or relative position of the tag and the body of the complex because I knew this could potentially cause heterogeneity and, and problems with aligning particles, especially at this size. 
So altogether, we had 150 kilodalton complex, including the tag and the RNA, which is about 10 kilodaltons. And we purified this complex by size exclusion chromatography. Um, it does have a little lower band there, but primarily it, it's looking pretty good. We've got the RNA. Um, and then uh, we don't have an in-house cryo EM. So at the time I, I drove to SUNY <laughs> on the week. It was a very painful process and we did it one grid at a time with, um, at that time with um, Stefan Wilkins there helping me and manually plunging the grids. So then we got preliminary conditions and they looked a little bit like this. This is actually a nicer image later from um, the Talos Arctica at UMass Med, but you can still see those particles are really small. Um, so, so Stefan himself is not used to, Stefan Wilkins at, at SUNY ESF is not really used to things of this size and he was just like, oh my gosh, uh, good luck girl. So but he, he was trying to help me. So then um, through collaboration with Michael Green at UMass Med, um, I was able to collect data with the director Chen Zhu on the UMass Med Talos Arctica with the K3 detector. And um, you can see that we can see these little complexes here and align the particles. Um, and I was encouraged, I think we were pretty encouraged at the time, but you can also see that um, even though we're getting um, some domains resolved in the 2D classes, we're definitely not seeing the secondary structure that one might hope to see for an atomic resolution structure. Um, so, so we have information here, but maybe not the level of detail that we hope for in the end. So we still were able to reconstruct a 3D uh, model, or 3D electron density, and fit the crystal structures that we know into the electron density. This is primarily, primarily using SysTEM, um, which is Gregoriev's, Nikola, Nikola's, Nikos Gregoriev's uh, uh, program from now at UMass Med. And um, so we obtained this model that we show here. And it's a disappointingly blobby thing. However, there are some things that we can see. Um, one thing that we can note of interest is that the shape is curved consistent with the need to ultimately position the branch site next to the five prime splice site and ultimately the three prime splice site um, for, for a nucleophilic attack. So this this position does seem to be curved, and, and, and we had some faith in this model, primarily to this long alpha helix of u 2 f one which is obviously sticking out down here, and then SF1 also has a coiled coil, which is here. So you, there are some features you can kind of see to fit things in, plus we have all this extra stuff back here for MVP. Um, so what we can learn from this, it does seem to have a curved shape. Now, how much confidence do we have in this? How do we validate this model? And then ultimately, how do we improve it? Well, in fact, we had already collected small angle X-ray scattering data at the Sybil's bean line. And we had a model, which I was uncomfortable with because it is small angle X-ray scattering. So, you know, 30 angstrom resolution is, um, but so we had a model already and remarkably, the small angle X-ray scattering or SACS model agrees quite well with the um, cryo-EM model at this approximately 12 angstrom resolution on the left. So both of them are curved. And because we obtained the SACS data using three different data sets that were missing certain subunits, we were able to um, actually identify potential locations of the different subunits in the SACS data as well. And again, this matches, the, the locations match. So we have a large, um, lump here for the MVP and U2F1. You can almost see in here that this is probably the U2F1 here with MVP in the back. Um, the blue region is, uh, we know this is U2F2 based on the, the different data sets. And the green region we know is SF1. And the region I was sort of uncomfortable with this to begin with is this sort of bipartite. Um, I didn't know what to make of this two finger thing of this SF1. It's like, oh what's going on there, but it actually it makes sense in retrospect because this the part that's sticking out in the back here is most likely the coiled coil of SF1, and the domain down here is most likely the KH domain. And I, I, don't, I don't show it here, but we also collected data um, for the SACs in the absence of RNA, and it is quite different. It becomes more linear and more of an ensemble. So, so it does seem that we most likely do have RNA bound in our cryo-EM structure because it has this curved shape and agrees with the SACs. We can't identify the contacts or exactly the path of the RNA yet, but this is something that we hope for in the future.
All right, so we do have some future work to do here. All right, so we have some information about this curved shape of the three prime splice site from cryoam and small angle x-ray scattering. So in parallel, we were using an orthogonal method, um, single molecule Forster resonance energy transfer in collaboration with our colleague down the hall, Dmitry Ermolenko. So by using single molecule FRET, we get different information about the nature of the three prime splice site. Again, a future goal is how do we recognize in the context of the 3D structure of the whole three prime splice site, but with using a FRET, we can obtain information on the dynamics of the different domains and how one subunit is influencing the other. All right, so I am running late, so I am seeing this. So I think I'm going to go through this quite quickly so that I can tell you about the second part uh, about the small molecule. So what I want to say here is that, first of all, we label the U2AF2 subunit because the U2AF1 has, of course, cysteines in the zinc knuckles. And we tethered it typically via our wonderful MBP Simo tag, uh, which we later adopted for the cryoEM. But by doing so, that means that we're only looking at the heterodimer. So we're only look at, looking at labeled U2AF2 in the context of the heterodimer. And we chose the positions of the labels to distinguish the U2AF conformations, the open side-by-side -side conformation and the back-to-back -back conformation. So we have a tool here to look at the different U2AF conformations and how the U2AF1 subunit and RNA can affect them. So I'm just going to cut to the chase. You may recall that the by itself, in FRET and SACS experiments, the U2AF2 subunit appears as primarily a en conformational ensemble. But when we add U2AF1, remarkably, the uh, ensemble shifts to a very um, a, a tight, relatively tight peak at a high FRET value, and the traces are relatively stable. And so, as opposed to fluctuating traces for the um, U2AF2 subunit alone. If we add RNA, the peak shifts. It switches down to a low FRET value, shown here in purple. And the traces are still stable but it's, it switches its conformation, or appears to. We can confirm that this is taking place by titrations with RNA and also by a reverse immobilization scheme where we immobilize the, we tether the RNA itself and then add the protein and we see the same type of switching. So we have confidence that this is taking place. So a logical conclusion is that what's happening is that the, that the U2AF1 subunit is, is stabilizing the back-to-back -back conformation of U2AF2, which is closed, and that adding RNA can switch it back into a side-by-side -side conformation based on the high and low fret states that are expected to be associated with, with the different, um, they're expected to be reported on by the positions of the fluorophores. And to confirm that, we used a structure-guided mutation, which had been previously characterized by Michael Sattler in NMR and shown to promote the closed back-to-back um, -back state. And we so see in FRET experiments, if we use this mutation, that rather than the, the, um, the entirely low FRET state, which would correspond to the open U2EF, the mutation can shift partially up part of the population back to the higher fret state. So this supports the conclusion that what's happening is that U2AF1 is stabilizing a particular high fret state, which is the open core conformation. And this makes sense because in the U2AF1 dependent splice sites, the um, only one of the two RMs is available for RNA binding, and that has a footprint of a very short polypromy tract. So this makes sense, that U2AF1 assists U2AF to bind to weak short splice sites by promoting this closed conformation. But when u 2 is presented with a very strong splice site, site like the ADML RNA, it will switch back into its side by side conformation and bind there. So it's very interesting. It suggests that u 2 f one is more of a, it can actually be a conformational switch 
for you to react to. And this could also be part of our, our interesting uh, challenges with uh, cryo-EM because it could be a source of conformational heterogeneity that might be hard to resolve for these small domains. All right, so um, this is the conclusion to the first part of my talk and is ten of one. So I will go very quickly through the second part. Um, but what we conclude is that um, we have a curved shape for the three prime splice site complex and that U2AF1 can modulate the U2AF2 conformations depending on um, the nature of the bound RNA. So I just want to spend the last, you know, five, five to seven minutes of your time on how small molecule modulators can, um, can affect U2AF and, and whether these can um, selectively kill cancer cells. Cut to the chase, yes. So, um, yeah, and we're almost done. <laughs> so, um, so myelodysplastic syndromes currently lack a chemotherapeutic cure. They are rather relatively rare, uh, but they most often occur in um, older uh, older gentlemen who like to go golfing because of the uh, the um, the uh, the herbicides in the grass, actually. So that's your typical MDS patient. However, the poster child is Robin Roberts, an African-American woman, because she had treatment for breast cancer, and the chem chemotherapy can also cause MDS to develop. Um, so MDS is a bone marrow disorder, um, as shown here. The, the bone marrow cells actually become big. They can't uh, mature properly into um, blood cells. And about a third of the cases progress to leukemia. Other, otherwise, patients die from heart failure because they just can't get enough blood or, or from immune, you know, the immune system is also compromised. And the only curative treatment is a bone marrow transplant, which emphasizes that if we had a specific chemotherapy, this would be really great. It's really needed. So, so we went out to, to look and see if we could identify molecules that it could affect U2AF, and we had hope for this based on a successful precedent, uh, precedent set by small molecule inhibitors of SF3B1. So there are um, RNA splicing targeted targeted chemotherapeutics out there. Probably the most, most well-known is one called ris, uh, ris platin, uh, Ristamine, which targets the SMN, uh, a specific site of SMN, but it's a very specific uh, RNA-targeted therapy and it won't work for cancers because it's specific for the SMN transcript. Um, the most successful precedent to date for that I know of for um, cancers and MDS has been these small molecule inhibitors of SF3B1. They bind to SF3B1 all in the same site. They're really complex to make, which is hard. And um, they're originally natural products from, of all things, bacteria, but also Don redwood trees, which are nearly ex an endangered kind of tree that grows in China. So um, it's interesting that nature has converged on this particular site and this particular splicing factor. But they've had, um, they had some success in um, preclinical models where they can selectively kill splicing compromised cells of all types, those that have transcription defects that are overloading the spliceosome, and those that carry splicing factor mutations are different copy numbers. These SF3B1 inhibitors can selectively kill them. Uh, but they only had limited success in uh, clinical trials. Um, a certain percent of patients became transfusion independent. There was a lot of politics going on, I think, around the company at the time, so I'm not certain. Um, I don't really know that. Uh, I think their future may have been compromised in part because of pol political issues, but and also the choice of the patients, perhaps. So they didn't have a whopping home run with this, and it hasn't been progressing farther. Um, but the most recent clinical trials, the only um, really major side effect that I know of was unwanted hair growth, which if you're going to die, maybe that's OK, although it was suggested that we could also use this for baldness. But um, I was told maybe it's not the kind of hair that you really want all the time. So. Um, it was more like the unibrow hair. So um, these um, SF3B1 inhibitors are a really great start, um, but why are they all targeting SF3B1? There are so many splicing factors, and U2F is so important, and it's also mutated in um, myelodysplastic syndromes. So we thought, why not target U2F1? So we developed a polarization-based screen which I can tell you about more about if you're interested, but I'm going to skip ahead. 
And we found initially in a screen for inhibitors of U2AF that we could not, um, that, well, we, we identified specific inhibitors, but in what we found in, in counter screens with the RNA only, that these inhibitors were binding to the RNA. Now, this could still be interesting if they happen to be sequence specific, but we d had doubt that they would be because one of them was elliptocene, and they all seem to be in the same family. And elliptocene binds by intercalation. So we set them aside as lower prior priority for now because even though Rizplatin is binding an RNA site and it's really successful, we, we had doubt that we could specifically target a splice site using um, intercalators. But we may come back to these later. So instead, Against my wishes, my graduate student went on and decided to screen for enhancers. And this is Rakesh Shatriki, who is now at Ericus Therapeutics. He did a screen for small molecules that would actually enhance the interaction between u 2 and RNA. And it worked. So he got one compound, and I'm still like, oh, OK, great. Well, now what are we going to do? It enhances the interaction. And it has a pretty weak um, uh, EC50 here, but it's still it's still working and it seems to be specific. And the molecule is shown down here. It has hydrophobic and a sort of zuterionic portion. Um, what was really interesting is that we then tested it in in vitro splicing assays. And this small molecule enhancer of U2AF actually inhibited splicing in vitro pretty well. And this is with the typical ADML. It's the, it's the in vitro substrate that always works. So it's like the strongest splice that you can get. And even so, this enhancer was able to stall splicing. And this is true both in qPCR on the left and in a denaturing gel on the right. And so why is this? Why is it stalling splicing? It should be enhancing splicing. U2IF is required for splicing. And it turns out the reason is that the small molecule, the small molecule appears to trap or stall the U2AF2 including stage of spliceosome assembly down here in the HE complex. Um, so this is actually uh, going over here. So you can see that more compound is added, there's more accumulation of this complex that includes that is expected to include the U2AF2 subunit. So this shows that by trapping a checkpoint complex at an early stage of a multi-step multi process that you can actually inhibit that process. So instead of actually trying to break apart things, you can also try to promote them. And then this can be used as an alternative way to inhibit a process. And there are lots of these processes out there, right? You know, you got your um, protein folding, you got grow yell, you got um, ubiquitin pathways, you got all these things that you could use this for. So, and most likely they are out there. Maybe many of the compounds that we're using now do act at early stages. Um, for those that have not been mechanistically um, examined. So this is an interesting um, sort of insight here. So then we went on and did some didactic work on this. And I think since I'm out of time that I will just skip ahead um, and cut to the chase. We did optimization and we found um, that through a, a combination of uh, assays and, and in vitro docking that the um, that we that the compound appears to bind between the two RMs of the U2F2 subunit, even though we use the entire subunit for our um, screening assay. And um, we found that both the hydrophobic and charged portions of the compound are important for it to inhibit slicing. We were not able to optimize it yet, what we hope to in the future. And um, I think this is the important take home here. When we treat cells, this is he just hex cells, um, with the compound and compare U2AF2 knockdown, we see a similar effect of compound treatment. So this shows that not only can the compound inhibit in vitro splicing with the ADML prototype, it also can inhibit U2AF2 sensitive transcripts, splicing of U2AF2 tra sensitive transcripts and cells. Then we turned to the K562 um, leukemia cell line, and we compared the, the effects of treatment with the compound between the wild type U2AF1 and the um, S34F mutant 
and we found that the treatment with the compound would exacerbate the splicing defects due to the S34F mutant for the, the transcripts that we examined. You can see that the S34F mutation of U2AF associated with cancer alters splicing and that when you treat with compound, it makes it even worse. So that was also promising. And then all this makes sense when we see that if we treat cell lines, and this is my last slide, if we treat cell lines that are either carrying an, an inducible U2AF1 with the wild type or S34F mutant, or an edited cell line, which really is trying to mimic the more true um, MDS state of the cells with the, uh, physiological levels of U2AF1, that the compound is more selectively lethal to the cells that carry the U2AF1 mutation. And so this is very promising as a starting point for using the compound to treat myelodysplastic syndromes. Of course, it's very weak, but we can see we, we you know, with, with development or with a, a new screen that we might be able to find something that targets U2AF2 and could be used to selectively kill um, the MDS mutant um, cells. So that is my story for today. Um, can small molecules of U2AF be identified and selectively kill cancer cells? Yes. And it can do so by blocking an early stage of the, or by enhancing um, an early stage of the pathway and thereby blocking it. All right. Um, this is my group. We are friendly and smiling, um, and our noses are clean under there, I promise. So, and um, many thanks to funding Evans Foundation, and thank you, Stephen, for a wonderful project and for having me here today. And I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you very much, Clara. That was uh, a tour de force. So, uh, sorry, let me just uh, complete the... Um, uh, so I'm just uh, scanning the chat, looking for questions. And I'm also looking at the participant list to see if there is anybody with their hand up. Yeah, uh, Elizabeth, uh, did I see Elizabeth Rosenzweig with a hand up? I see Greg. Greg Critchlow with a hand up. Greg, please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> It's good seeing you again. I remember meeting you um, years ago when you visited Yale. Oh um, my goodness. Okay. I, I had a question about the mutation, right? You mentioning um, the um, stabilization of the U2AF. Um, I'm, wait, is this one or two? Um, stabilizing the conformation of the other. Mm -hmm. Yes. But you mentioned the larger component has only about a 1% mutation rate in myelodysplasia. Are those, are those mutations seen in the same patients who have the mutations in the smaller subunit, being that one is stabilizing the other? Are these compensatory or contributing one to another or just random? Do you know, um, good question. They are very... Um they never co-occur. The splicing factor ne mutations never co-occur. They're probably just, it's, it would be too much for the cells, right? So they, they ne yeah, they never co-occur. So, so, so you think that that would be lethal then? Yeah, I think that would be lethal. Yeah. So, so there, there are no compensatory mutations that can happen in one, two, the stabilized, um, none that you know of. I don't know of any, no. Um, actually, the splicing factor mutations tend to go um, to only occur, not only not co-occur with other mutations, but they, as far as I as can remember right now, that might, except for maybe SF3B1 in certain types of cancers, usually they are, they are, they're the only acquired mutations that occur. So yeah, good question though. Thank you, great talk. Thank you, Greg.